hey guys welcome back to my channel it is true crime tuesday yet again and yes i know it's been a while since i've uploaded one of these videos but i just wanted to assure you guys that i will keep on making these videos as long as you want me to today's case is not actually an asian case but it is a very popular one especially if you are into true crime Today, we will be talking about the sinister death of six-year-old beauty queen, John Benet Ramsey. So without further ado, let's go ahead and dive into this case. Alright, so John Benet Patricia Ramsey was born on August 6, 1990 in Atlanta, Georgia. However, she grew up in Boulder, Colorado with her father, John Bennett, mother Patsy, and older brother Burke. John Benet's mother, Patsy, actually grew up joining beauty pageants and was even crowned Miss West Virginia in 1977. And her love and passion for joining these contests is something that she actually passed on to her daughter, John Benet. Now, John Benet was a very pretty and bright kid. And she was actually getting pretty well known in the pageant industry, despite of being only six years old. And based on my research, at this point in her life, she had actually already won five major pageants. So that says a lot about how good this kid was. She definitely had a future within that industry. Now, this family, the Ramsey family, really had it going for them. John Bennett, the father, was the CEO and the president of a large company. They lived in a 15-bedroom mansion in an upscale neighborhood in Boulder, Colorado. Plus, they had two beautiful and healthy children. However, tragedy struck in the morning after Christmas year 1996. When Patsy woke up at around 5 a.m. only to find her daughter, Jean Binet, missing from her own bedroom. 911 emergency. Oh, Police. What's going on? 515th Street. What's going on there, ma'am? We have a kidnapping. All right, please. Explain to me what's going on, okay? There, we have a, there's a note left and our daughter's gone. A note was left and your daughter is yes. gone? How old is your daughter? Six years old. She's gone. How long ago was it? I don't know. I just found the note. Oh my God, this is it say who took her? What? Does it say who took her? No. I don't know. It's, it's a, there's a ransom note here. It's a ransom note? It says FBTC. Victory. Now, strangely, or at least in my opinion, it is quite strange the family started to call up and invite their family and friends over to their house right after making this 911 call. Now, um, a logical explanation for this would be that they wanted help and they wanted more people to be notified of John Benet's disappearance. But once the police arrived to begin their investigation, the family home, which is now considered to be a crime scene, had already been tampered with or compromised. Now, the authorities took a look at this ransom note, and based on what they read, there was no reason to believe that John Binet would still be inside the house. So, because of this, they decided to skip searching the property altogether. However, this would become a grave mistake because just less than 8 hours after she was discovered to be missing, John Benet's body was then discovered by her father, specifically in the utility room inside their basement. The poor 6-year-old girl was found with duct tape covering her mouth and with a cord or wire around her neck. And as true crime enthusiasts, we know that you should never touch a body or even get in close proximity of it to avoid contamination and compromising possible evidence. However, as a grieving father, John was just overwhelmed with emotion and without thinking much, he went ahead and picked up his daughter's body and brought it to the main floor 
So not that he only contaminate the body, he also compromised the actual crime scene. Now, of course, this was ruled as a homicide. And based on the autopsy, it was reported that John Binet was actually bludgeoned to death because she did have some blunt force trauma on her skull. However, the county coroner ruled this out saying that the actual cause of death was asphyxiation due to strangulation. A paintbrush from Patsy's own art kit was actually used to tighten the cord around John Binet's neck. DNA was also found on her pajamas and her underwear, both belonging to a single unidentified man. Also, two unidentified footprints were found inside the Ramsey home but not outside in the snow. So that is something to take note of. Also, a rope that did not belong to the family was also found in John Binet's room. Now, this DNA sample was actually entered into the database in 2014, 18 years after the murder. However, no matches were found out of 1.5 million samples. But here's where things get really weird and highly suspicious. The three-page ransom note. Alright, so I do have my notes here. And this note or the ransom letter started with, Dear Mr. Ramsey, listen carefully. We are a group of individuals that represent a small foreign faction. We respect your business but not the country that it serves. This note also demanded the Ramses pay 118,000 US dollars in return for John Binet's safety. And this amount was extremely close to the bonus that John received that year. So how would the kidnappers know about that? The letter was signed SBTC Victory and up to this day no one still knows what that means. On an even weirder note, the letter was actually found to be written inside the family home using the stationery or notepad beside the house phone. And a piece of a practice note was actually found in the trash. So that's pretty weird. Now here's my two cents about that whole ransom letter ordeal. First of all, who writes a three-page ransom letter inside the family home using the family's notepad and the family's pen and even has time to write a practice note? So that's quite suspicious. I mean, I personally think that a kidnapper would keep something like this very brief or, you know, with as little detail as possible. Your handwriting could be tested and the way you word things could be used in the investigation. Also, I think that a kidnapper or at least a smart one wouldn't write that much detail or give out clues on who they are, let alone what they stand for. Plus, $118,000 is a very, very specific amount. It's just weird. So why why not ask for a hundred thousand dollars or two hundred thousand, a hundred and fifty, a hundred and twenty even? Um it's just super weird. Plus, you know for a fact that you are coming into this house to take a little girl. Shouldn't you at least prepare for this? Like, I don't know, have a ransom note prepared already and maybe have your own murder tools? Uh, yeah, so those are my thoughts regarding the letter, but moving forward. Also, something that I really couldn't wrap my head around is, why did they kill John Binet if their goal was to get $118,000 off of the Ramsey family? I mean, that's why they kidnapped her in the first place, right? so that the family would pay them off in exchange for the child's safe return. A lot of things just doesn't add up and doesn't make sense in this case. 
but we'll return to that later. Now let's take a look at the list of suspects and their possible motives. Now, first off, we have the Ramsey family themselves. This family went under heavy scrutiny and suspicion when the authenticity of the letter was questioned. And even more eyes turned to them when it was revealed that no footprints was found outside in the snow and that no signs of forced entry were ever found. Now, John and Patsy's handwritings were also analyzed by professionals, and this completely ruled out John, leaving Patsy's handwriting analysis to be inconclusive. Now, some sources theorize that either Patsy or nine-year-old Burke may have accidentally knocked John Benet out, and therefore staged the strangulation which, in return, actually caused her death. The DNA found on John Benet's underwear and pajamas also did not match with anyone in the family, completely exonerating them. Second on the list of suspects, we have a guy named Bill McReynolds. Now, he is a local man who would often dress up as Santa Claus during the Christmas season. And in my opinion, he was added onto this list due to very circumstantial reasons. Now, it was discovered that Bill actually visited the Ramsey home just two days before the murder occurred. Now, authorities started to look at Bill as a possible suspect because it was discovered that in 1974, Bill's own daughter was also actually abducted or kidnapped. And coincidentally, his wife had also written a play about a young girl who was molested, then murdered in her own basement. During one interview, Bill says that he took John Benet's death very hard and that he felt a special connection with the six-year-old. He also revealed that he had even brought a vial of glitter gifted to him by John Benet into open-heart surgery and requested for his wife to mix it with his ashes if he didn't come out of the operating room alive. Now, I'm very personally torn about this whole vial of glitter thing. Um, I'm not really sure if this was sweet or creepy. But according to Bill, this vial of glitter was very precious to him since no other child had ever gifted him during the time that he was dressed as Santa Claus. Bill was then ruled out after test results show that his DNA wasn't a match to the DNA that was found on John Benet's clothes and underwear. Third, we have a guy named Gary Oliva, who was actually arrested for child pornography and unrelated drug charges. Now, he became a suspect when he was found to be carrying a photo of John Benet Ramsey in his backpack and said that John Benet's murder touched him deeply and that he felt that she was an unexceptional loss and that he felt like he needed to build a shrine to remember her. Now, a friend of Gary also revealed that a day after the murder, Gary called him and said, I hurt a little girl, and that he had done it in Boulder, Colorado, where the Ramses live. However, Gary was also not a match to the DNA evidence found at the crime scene. And lastly, for the list of suspects, we have a guy named John Mark Carr. He is a divorced elementary teacher who only became a suspect 10 years after the murder. He confessed to the killing via email to a journalist and professor named Michael Tracy, who had been in contact with him for the past four years. Now, according to this professor slash journalist, Talking to John Mark Carr was horrible and was by far the worst experience of his life. Carr used similar wording to that of the ransom note and new personal details about the family, such as Patsy's mother's nickname, Neddy. He also confessed to being in love with the six-year-old girl and that he hit her in the head with a flashlight. Now, I forgot to mention that a flashlight, a huge flashlight, was also found inside the Ramsey home. But I think this flashlight actually belonged to the family. And this was also believed to be what was used to hit 
John Benet over the head. However, this was disclosed to the public, so it is possible that John Mark Carr just heard about this in the news. In 2008, he was tracked down in Thailand where he went to after trying to escape child pornography charges in the U.S. He says that he did not act alone and it is possible that the DNA found was that of who he was working with. And as I have mentioned earlier, there were two sets of unidentified footprints found inside the home. And that the ransom letter was actually signed by a group of individuals and not just one person. Now, despite this confession, John Mark Carr was not charged with John Benet's murder. Due to his DNA not matching with the evidence and according to the former Boulder police chief, his confession did not match with the evidence and that they knew right away. About 18 hours in after his confession, they knew right away that he was bluffing. By doing some routine checking, they also discovered that Carr was not even in Colorado during the time of the murder and was instead in Georgia, in a completely different state. So it seems that this guy was just bluffing because he had an obsession with six-year-old John Benet Ramsey. Now in 2022, 26 years after the murder, this case is still unsolved. And sadly, Patsy, John Benet's mother, actually passed away in 2006 due to ovarian cancer and she never had the chance to see justice for her daughter. And when I first heard about this case, it absolutely drove me nuts. At first, I was so sure that someone in the family did it. However, as I've mentioned earlier, they were all completely exonerated. There's just so many possibilities when it comes to the evidence found and the list of possible suspects. And yet, no one knows for sure who did it except for the person who actually did. It's very frustrating and I really want to know your thoughts and opinions on this. I would love to read your theories regarding this case. So let's go ahead and have a healthy discussion in the comment section below if you're up for it. And yeah, I guess that's pretty much it for today's true crime video. Thank you so much for listening to John Benet's story. And I hope you guys found that interesting. Don't forget to always be vigilant and take care. And I'll see you guys on my next video.